Thanks to partnership with the Georgia Department of Public Health and funding from the Environmental Protection Agency's Beach Grant, the Coastal Resources Division of the Georgia Department of Natural Resources makes sure that swimming in our beaches is safe for everyone. The Coastal Resources Division administers beach water quality monitoring, public notification, and data reporting to the Environmental Protection Agency and other water quality agencies. Georgia beaches are categorized into three tiers. Tier 1 beaches are the most heavily visited on the coast. They're located on the more populated barrier islands of Tybee, St. Simons, and Jekyll Island. Tier 2 beaches are less accessible and generally have fewer visitors and amenities. Most are only accessible by boat. Tier 3 beaches are remote and not easily accessible. They generally have almost no potential pollution sources apart from wildlife. Advisory zones have been set for each Tier 1 and Tier 2 beach. Beaches are monitored on a predetermined weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly schedule depending on time of the year. Beaches under a permanent swimming advisory are sampled quarterly. When elevated bacteria levels are detected at a sampling location in Tier 1 or 2, a swimming advisory is issued for the associated zone. Specifically, the Coastal Resources Division's water quality technicians are looking for the presence of the bacteria Enterococcus, which is found in the guts of warm-blooded animals. At each beach, water samples from the swimming zone are collected in sterile 250 milliliter bottles. The bottle is submerged to knee depth where the sample is collected. The bottle is then capped and labeled for transport. A CRD technician then uses a meter to collect readings for dissolved oxygen, pH, water temperature, and other factors. Data from the meter is recorded on a field data sheet along with information about weather conditions and tidal stage. The sample bottles are then packed into a cooler for transport to the Coastal Resources Division's Georgia Shellfish and Water Quality Laboratory located at Coastal Regional Headquarters in Brunswick. The cooler keeps the samples at the correct temperature as specified by the EPA. Samples are transported to the lab within six hours of collection. The lab then processes samples within two hours of receipt. The processed samples will be incubated for 24 hours. Once incubation is complete, a technician counts the bacteria colonies and calculates the bacteria level per 100 milliliters. The technician then enters the laboratory results into the beach water quality database. A single sample result of 70 per 100 milliliters or greater is the beach action value, or BAV, and will trigger a water quality notification. The Coastal Resources Division partners with the Coastal Health District of the Georgia Department of Public Health to issue beach advisories for the affected area. The Coastal Health District issues swimming advisories to educate the public about health risks associated with swimming in waters with elevated bacteria levels. Other partners within local municipalities also activate signs at beach access points when an advisory is issued. Beach advisory information is also posted on the Coastal Resources Division website where an interactive map displays the current beach advisory status for each beach on the Georgia coast. Clicking on a beach opens a pop-up window showing the date and results of the latest water sample at that beach. A beach advisory does not mean a beach is closed. Rather, it simply warns the public that there is an elevated risk for swimming due to higher than normal levels of bacteria. When an advisory is made, the beach is resampled within a 24-hour period. Once back to an acceptable level, the advisory is lifted. It's all part of the Coastal Resources Division's mission to preserve Georgia's coast for present and future generations. All right, welcome back to the Coast Fest studio. JT and Jennifer are ready to take any questions you may have about their program. To ask a question, use the chat feature on YouTube Live or comment on our live Facebook feed. To use the YouTube Live chat, you'll need to sign in as a user and set up your YouTube channel. You can find directions at www.coastalgadnr.org slash coastfest. While we wait on questions to come in, I'm going to go ahead and get started with a few of my own. How do you decide what beaches to test? Great question, Jackson. Um, we decide that using a, different, uh, a variety of factories. Uh, one of them is usage. Um, so if there's a lot of people that go to a specific beach, um, we're going to test that um, as, as often as we can. And then you got to have access to that beach. 
So if you can drive to that beach and you can visit that beach, then we're probably testing it. And when you're on that beach, you're gonna be able to see our signs, which you saw in that nice video. Is, here's our monitoring signs, and when, it's, when the beach is recommended swimming levels, the bacteria levels are at recommended levels, it's down. And then when it's up, you get to see all the nice information, and I covered my face. And you get to see everything on here that explains in both English and Spanish of um, why we are not recommending for you to swim that day. Um, but we will be back out there to resample as quickly as possible. What are samples, why are samples taken at knee level? Well, that's because it's what we call waiting depth. So that's the depth that most people, um, both children and adults, will be in the water for the most part. Um, also, we don't want to send our people out at every station to get completely covered by water. <laughs> that just, I don't think that'd be very nice to them, especially in the winter. Yeah, as much as I love swimming, and I do, um, but it'd be kind of hard to do with, a, with a, a meter, bottles, and a cooler. But yeah, we go out to, to, to that depth because it's it easy. It also provides a, it, the same across the board. Mm -hmm. So no matter what kind of beach it is, you're still going to about the same depth. How many samples do you process in the lab during a month period? We do 16 beaches every week. Um, so that would be four times 16, whatever that, that is. That is 64. And we have tier two samples <laughs> um, that we do once a month. Yep. And I think there's about eight of those stations. And the tier one samples are, the, are your Jekyll, St. Simons, and Tybee Island. Those are the ones of the most, uh, with the most usage and access. And then your tier two beaches are the ones that are a little harder to get to. A lot of times you have to get there via a, um, a boat. So a lot of time that is a, a sandbar. And so you have people in the summer that get up on a sandbar and you'll pull the boats up on the sandbar and we actually go out in our vessel and sample those um, monthly during the high usage months, which are from April to October. What does the meter test? The meter tests conductivity, salinity, temperature, pH, and turbidity. And actually, we brought one today. So you can say we use a hydrolab, and the, we're looking at collecting this data over years so that we can track it and if anybody wants to use it. Um, and our most important um, data that we collect um, is the salinity, the pH, and the temperature. Um, that's the ones we actually use. And it looks like we do have a question coming from Facebook. Uh, Caitlin Ball, do you enjoy sampling? What is your favorite thing about your job? Um, I love sampling. It's fun. We get a, an excuse to go to the beach um, every Monday. It's fun. I mean, you can't, um, you can't hate your job if you're out there on the beach every Monday um, enjoying the sun. I've had enjoyed doing it for the past seven years. Um, and I would say my favorite part of my job is the sampling. Um, I don't get to do it as often now that I'm the, the, the coordinator. So, but when I do get out there, I really enjoy it. I'd say my favorite part, I don't get to go out on the beach with them, but my favorite part is seeing the growth on the plates and seeing the ones that means I can say, this, this beach is clean, it's good, and we don't have to worry about it right now. What can happen if I swim at the beach that is under advisory? Most likely, absolutely nothing but a really fun time. So um, you're probably going to be just fine and have uh, a great time at the beach with your family. Um, but we put it under advisory just because there has been heightened levels of bacteria. And we do have another question from Leslie Jones, second grade uh, her second grade class. Do unsafe waters hurt the animals? Um, no. no, I don't. I don't have. Um, it depends on the animal. Um, an aquatic animal that lives in the water, probably not. Uh, they're going to leave the area for the most part. If your dog is out there playing and might swallow some water that's, you know, unsafe for you to swallow, then they might get sick. So it just kind of depends on what the animal is and what the situation is. Again, it's not likely to happen. You'd have to be already kind of sick for it to probably up upset you. All right, we have one from Robert Todd from the McIntosh County Academy, Academy Commercial Fisheries class. Do higher bacteria levels tend to show up with warmer water temperatures? Yes. That's it depends a, on the bacteria. Yeah, it is. But yes. Right. Um, what I tend to see more is higher bacteria levels with associated rainstorms. 
um, if we have a lot of fresh water coming in, if we have a lot of flooding coming down, bringing in all kinds of nutrients and pollution from upriver, that's when we really start to see um, higher bacteria levels. But absolutely, it does affect um, the growth. I mean, these are bacteria that like warm waters. Uh, and from animal sources from and animal birds. Sources, um, yeah. So, like, if you notice, like on uh, especially uh, Jekyll and St. Simons, you'll see on the north end and south ends of those islands, you'll see the large congregation of birds. And so all those birds are just sitting there on the beach and they're pooping. And so <laughs> it's like it's gonna it's gonna cause bacteria levels yeah. to increase. Yeah, and then the higher temperature will make those bacteria in that poop a higher level. So we've got another question from Leslie Jones, second grade class. If the water is unsafe, does it affect the animal's food? If it were to stay unsafe for a long period of time, it could. Uh, they wouldn't grow as well. You could lead to hypoxia, which is there's too much um, nutrients in the water, which means there's not enough for the animals. Um, what we're lucky for here in Georgia is we have such a huge tide and so much water coming in and out that pollution levels get washed out very quickly. And so our water stays very, very clean and refreshed all the time. And, re and recycling, yep, yeah. recycling that water. Do storms affect the bacteria readings? Absolutely. Yeah, great question, Jackson. Yep, they definitely Absolutely. do. Uh, like I was saying earlier, the storms will wash the, the, wash the pollution, the, the pollution being in forms of animal waste, of nutrients coming from farms, of all kinds of things, and that goes right into our ocean. Um, yep. In, the, in the, the marshes, you've got large amounts of animals in the marshes, and yeah. if you get inundation where the water covers upland too, any type of, any type of uh, waste that you have on the ground is going to get picked up by those big tides and big waves and storm events and pulled right back out into the ocean. That's why it's so important to pick up, if you take your dog out for a walk, pick up the dog's waste and dispose of it properly. Because on those, it's just going to sit there and it's going to get picked up. And some of that obviously is natural. So it's like there's animals that are going to go to the bathroom all over the place and we're not going to go walking around following deer around picking up after them. <laughs> but it's like that's, that's why the marsh and nature is all designed as a big cycle to process that waste. And we do have another question from Leslie Jones, second, second grade class. What types of things make the water polluted? Great question. Um, I would say mostly it's nutrients and, and bacteria from, uh, you're looking from, from animal sources. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's like to, to just to build off what we talked about in the last question, it's important just to pick up the waste. Um, yeah. And it's luckily, uh, like we said before, our tide stages are so big and you've got six to nine foot tides that are flushing and constantly moving that water. When you go to that, you, you just think about it. If you go to the beach Monday and you go back to the beach Tuesday, you're dealing with a totally different set of water. It's completely different. It's being flushed out. It's like you taking a bath. You have just washed, you have just flushed that bathtub out and you've got a whole new bathtub. So. Mm -hmm. Why are um, Tiger Three beaches not tested? So tier three beaches are not tested because they're usually very difficult to get to. Um, so we have the tier one, which are easy to get to and a lot of people go. And then we have the tier two beaches that are generally harder to get to, but still have a pretty good amount of people that go. And now the tier three beaches are hard to get to and not many people go. So we don't see the value in statistically and from a public health standpoint to test, for, test the tier three beaches. Can anything cause a false reading? Sure. Um, it could be that when they take the sample, a little piece of bird poop got into the, into the bottle without knowing. Um, a lot of bacteria settles into the sand and bacteria is not great at swimming. So if the sand gets stirred up, then the bacteria gets stirred up. So if it gets too much, you know, when the sample is going out and accidentally kicks up too much sand, they might get a higher reading than what higher level of bacteria than what they would normally get. Um, sometimes, you know, there just may be uh, one happens to get a bacteria, one, one bacteria that just happens to float into our bottle and make it seem a lot bigger than other than it actually is. It just happens that it got into the bottle. Looks like we have another question from Leslie Jones, second grade class. 
uh, how does depleted water get cleaned up? Um, the biggest thing is having all of your uh, septic systems, if you're on a public sewer, instead of being on a septic system and you're right on the beach and you go into a public sewer, that's going to clean up. Um, and then also if you're, if you're picking up your animal's waste, if like everybody's going to the beach with their dogs and they pick up the waste, that's going to, that's going to keep the, the, the beach clean. And also, um, if you, if you have little, little ones, little babies, and you have diapers and you're changing out to make sure that you dispose of those diapers properly. Um, those are, also, those are big. you know, if we, as long as we keep our marshes healthy, they do an excellent job of cleaning up the pollution. That's kind of what their job is. So as the, wa the pollution gets into the marsh, it's capable of filtering out that water, getting rid of the pollution, and balancing out the system. Is there anything I can do to keep the water clean? Um, I think just building off what we've been talking about is... Uh, be a, you know, a good citizen. A good citizen is someone who likes to leave, uh, like practicing leave no trace principles. You know, you want to make sure that no one even knew you were there before you arrived at the beach. So when you go to the beach and you have a great time, put your beach towels out, pick up all your trash and pick mm -hmm. up any waste that you have and take it with you. Um, because we want to be able to use the resource for many years to come and make it just as safe for our children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Why do some beaches have permanent adversaries? So they're under a permanent advisory because we have seen there has been a trend of high bacteria levels. And we have three uh, permanently posted beaches in Georgia, um, and they were done purely because of, uh, you see a, a trend, and instead of sampling weekly and flipping an advisory, we decided to go ahead and permanently post those and show that uh, we have a trend of, of data going um, with high bacteria levels. Still means that um, it's mostly perfectly fine to, to swim and fish there, but you just need to uh, be aware and make sure that you know, you're practicing good principles and being safe. And that's all the time that we that's all the time we have for this session of Virtual Coast Fest. We hope you enjoyed learning about the Coastal Resources Division mission. Tune in next time.